Uh, welcome to the Inside Running Podcast, True Digs edition, uh, the month of March. I'm joined here by Tommy DeCanto over in Sydney. It looks like home. Is that home or is that the clinic? I'm at home today. Beautiful. And Julian Spence over in Anglesey. Is that right? No, I'm at, I'm at work. I'm in Geelong. Oh, you work? Yeah, okay. Good. Someone's got to work. little office. You can see. You Security yeah. camera. Beautiful. Dog next to me. Oh, jeez. Look at that. <laughs> wow. It's a room. It's such a roomy cage. Yeah. Wow. It's, he's running out of space. Yeah, this dog's just... getting bigger and bigger. Yeah, absolutely. How you guys been? You been well? Yeah. Busy. Good. You both. You both rang a lot. Yeah. You weren't happy with my increase in mileage last week, were you? Mate, you went from eighty k's. What a sick week! It was a bit of a sick week, wasn't it? Uh, to about one hundred eighty k's the week after. So. I'd planned on doing like a, the last couple of weeks building up, but leading into run the bridge, I had like a bit of a sore hammy. So I cut out yeah. a bit of bit of running there. And then, yeah, then I got man flu. So yeah. I just, just, just playing catch up, you know. But you ran well there. You, um, you were second Aussie across the line, fourth overall, is that right? Y- yeah, fourth bloke. Yep, yeah, two Ugandans, Jimmy oh, Hans, yeah. and then, yeah, then me. So, so yeah. you beat some good people. Mm. I think it's the first time I've beat Liam Adams. I don't think he was too happy about it. I don't think he's real fit because he came like third. <laughs> Come on, he's, fit. The... He's, he's PB. <laughs> he's, he's definitely PB shape. <laughs> Toby beat him. Oh, when, oh, what was this? On Sunday at Run for the Kids. Oh, did he? Yeah. <laughs> Tommy so just Tom... like crushed in his head right now. <laughs> he's going to spy. <laughs> uh, but Toby's Tommy... fit though. So another fit. another race, another Vaporfly experience for you. Yeah, so um, I I got a and I, will, will, I guess we, we can all chat about it. Hopefully, the um, I, got, I did get a pair of the Saucony Endorphin Elite, mm-hmm. and um, I was going to race in it, but I did a couple of runs in it, and to me, it still didn't feel um, quite like it was hitting my sweet spot of what I like a super shoe to do. So I, I, I reverted back. So I came to race day. I was like, look, I, yeah, I just, I just want to race in what, what I, I know feels good and works well. So I raced. Expl- in the- explain that Tom, you explain to us about a sweet spot of bottoming out for you. And I, I like the concept. I haven't really thought of it that way before, but you talked about the shoe needs to have a degree of compliance and you've got a bit of a sweet spot you like in terms of it getting down low enough and you're finding the endorphin elite you can't compress deep enough. Yeah, yeah. So that that's kind of one of the main reasons I, it, I don't think it, I gelled with it was the um, the amount the midsole uh, compressed. So we just call that like, yeah, compliance of the midsole. And um, I reckon, so... Obviously, the other factor is the resiliency. So the two, I think the two key factors for a good performing foam is the, the, the compliance or the softness and then the resiliency, which is the energy return. And I think like there was marketing uh, I heard around the um, Saucony Endorphin Elite um, having like this power run HG foam, which is a new foam, uh, having like more resiliency. So it's got like more energy return than the power run PB. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't feel as soft or as compliant. So to me, running in it, um, yes, it feels poppy, but it it doesn't compress down as much during the middle of mid stance, early push off. So it just feels like it's almost like it feels like to me, it's there's wasted midsole there. Like there's like I'm not compressing at all, which essentially because it's the benefit of the compliance is like you're basically getting a longer spring. So if you, if you, if you feel like it compressing down a lot and if it's resilient, then it's going to bounce back that same amount that you compressed it, which essentially means you've got a longer spring on your foot. Um, and so, yeah, the, the, the elite just didn't feel like it had a long spring. It just felt like it had this little, I've heard the analogy before of like a, a mini tramp versus a normal trampoline. So I can't remember who said that, but that's kind of what it feels like. It's like a, a these little mini, like a mini tramp, like a little, a little bit down and pops you up, or like a a, a trampoline where you, you can really feel like your whole body or your, your foot yeah. compressing into the midsole and then popping back. Gives out. you more back. Yeah. Um, so, like for me, like when I when I run in the um, the, the Zoom X foam, the compliance of that, it just feels soft enough that it with the stack height in the vapor fly it feels like i get clo- i get close to the bottom without bottoming out so i never feel like i'm bottoming out 
but I feel like it's compressing like a good like one yeah. one two centimeters. It, I can feel it feels like a, a spring basically. I don't and get that. That's, that's got to be relative to how much foam you compress over the whole distance of the shoe, doesn't it? So, for example, like if you hit back further on the shoe, you compress more foam from the back of the shoe through to the front of the shoe as you transition forward. You're less likely going to bottom the shoe out. But if you strike such a small surface area of the shoe with that impact, look, you maybe you can compress more the foam off that elite, the endorphin elite, then get more back. And that's what I feel when I wear the endorphin elite. I still feel like I'm getting pretty deep into the shoe with the foam compression um, on the forefoot. But when I do that on the Vaporfly, I feel like the shoe disappears in the forefoot straight away and I'm at the bottom of the ground instantly. And so the return of energy feels like I need the shoe to go deeper even more to get the spring back. So I don't want that firm ending point. So the Endorphin Elite to me feels the closest to perhaps maybe the Adios Pro did um, in terms of the foam. Like it felt a bit firmer, but if I hit a small zone, yeah, I you know got more back from it. But the Rockers are more aggressive in this Endorphin Elite than the Pro was, I found. So. Yeah. But it slips yeah. slips a bit, so I'm not sure how that would have gone in Hobart. Yeah, yeah. Um, Hopper, who we've had on here before, he um, he was worried at the start, and rightly so, because he, he slipped at like two, I think two k in or something. He had he had a stack um, wow. banged up his knee, going around a roundabout. Um, so yeah, it um, it's uh, it's it's not a good grip in the wet, that's for sure. Yeah, or no, again. it's almost like if you um, if you've got a race coming up. And you know it's going to be a little wet. You're going to have to take two pairs of shoes to the event because it's yeah. almost unserviceable in the wet. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Plenty yeah. of good things. That's good. That's yeah. good, Tommy. And what you're still training for? Yeah. Um, for Manchester, is that right? Ah, uh, for Hamburg. Hamburg, sorry. Um, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I did have that with the uh, a little scare. Uh, <laughs> got an MRI today uh because i thought i had a bone stress but um it doesn't seem like it is so i'm still going to keep training and just take some anti flames and just baby this foot through and see see how it goes but yeah it's, i think it's five five weeks to go so i need to get i wanted to get another couple of big weeks in so we'll yeah. see how that goes any races in between now and then or is it just the volume and nah, the there's now? nothing i yeah. couldn't yeah couldn't really fit anything in that's that's it so it was just there was around the bridge and then just um yeah just I'll do I'll do one I'll probably do one big kind of marathon long run with a, a faster bit in it or something but um yeah one or two it looks like you're it. loading your, your your fourth metatarsal a little bit as well um obviously when you're running so have you tried to work out like if there's been any shoe contribution to that at all or you've been shuffling between shoes to reconcile it or what uh yeah, well we thought you mean you were ten minutes late, mate? So I was just telling I was telling uh, Moose about <laughs> this. Uh, maybe I shouldn't have been doing so many miles in the, in the Nike Streak Fly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and the New Balance Rebel. And yeah, oh, so, I've been doing okay. I've been doing my long runs in the New Balance Rebel. <laughs> um, oh. Yeah, you deserve yeah. this. <laughs> well yeah so that's what i told you i was like when when i thought i had a this i thought it was bone i was like what are all the factors okay i made some mistakes the training definitely and then um yeah shoe choices um questionable yeah. but um no nah. shoe choices allow you to make more errors mate so you, you wear a bit more beneath that shoe with a bit of a plate there you offload those events a bit more yeah well that that's, this is going to bring us on to that study isn't it that we're going to chat yeah. about hopefully at some point but um <laughs> No, yeah, the, I'm gonna I'm gonna go to um back to a bit more of the Saucony Tempest. I yeah. am enjoying that shoe, so a bit bit more no, no plate, but Nimbus yeah. Nimbus and Nimbus from Asics and the, the Saucony Tempest a bit more in the rotation. Yeah, good, and that brings us on to you, Julian. You've been wearing more Nimbus 25, and you finally got the Super Blast, haven't you? Yeah, I did. I have had the Nimbus 25 for a while, and mm -hmm. uh, I was I'm surprised at how much I like that shoe. Um, it is a thicker upper i can feel that and at the toe cap internally i do catch the top of the toe cap with my um, yeah. toenails which isn't great either especially downhill i feel like i slip in the shoe did so, you go half up or did you stay true to no that is half up that is actually is, half yeah. up yeah so um maybe if my toes are close to the end i don't feel that uh that 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 meat point but i reckon if i was close to the end i'd get more toe soreness um, so, so the fit's not perfect on it, but underneath it is a great recovery shoe. 
like just the super easy day shoe. And it's a really good contrast to the, the super blast, which I am <laughs> holding here. Uh, so this is, if you looked at them together, you would think, oh, similar shapes, really. Mm. Like broader underneath, higher stack. I don't even know what the offset of this is. Do you guys know off the top of your head? I think it was it was 4739, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, I think okay. it was yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it's the same as a Nimbus then. Um, yeah. And, but underfoot, it's just like you don't sink in the shoe like you do the Nimbus. <laughs> this, yeah. oh, this would be one of those shoes that's not that resilient, Tom. Or not that compliant. Well, I, not, not, that yeah, compliant. not that compliant. Yeah. It's not very, that compliant. very resilient. Yeah. Yeah. So I, even I was expecting it to be way softer because on yeah. paper it competes with the Invincible uh, in terms of sort yeah. of what it does, yeah. but it doesn't feel like an Invincible at all. No. You got to hit it hard to get the magic out of it, I reckon. Well, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And and so it sort of suits higher paces on easy days, uh, and yeah. I've been using it as that type of shoe. Like I'll put it on uh, when I don't really have to recover when i give myself more of a license on an easy day yeah and it's for, it's for how for like what it is on paper a high stack of piva foam it's yep. actually really stable yeah, as well. it's really stable yeah yeah it feels more stable than the nimbus so yep. yeah it's been a it, it's like it's a sleeper in here as well we've still got yeah, yeah. sizes left in this yep. that are sitting on the wall and i'm, I'm thinking how we, how is this remaining here like we're not yeah. marketing this well enough because this is a this bit is of a unicorn of, out there. It's one, one of the better long run shoes I've ever worn and a license to pick up the pace. The weight's minimal. Um, you can get going in the shoe. It's extremely stable. The upper, look, it's probably a little bit narrow in the forefoot with a taper, um, but it's not that bad. I, I find this one run true to size though. I found the Nimbus I went up half and this I ran true to size. Um, but look, that's just me personally. I'm not sure if that's the sample we were given as well. But Tom, you found these true to size, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, true to size, definitely not small. Mm. Why yeah. are you wearing this for your long runs, Tom? I uh, remember, so I had a bit of a extensive tendon irritation with oh. this shoe. Like I was doing long runs in it. I was doing a yeah. fair bit in it and loving it. Um, yeah. But I think just one of the eyelets was like right over the big toe extensor tendon. Um, it took three days to settle. I just haven't gone back to it, but I, I yeah. reckon I, I reckon I'll give it another go because... Um, yeah, you talking about it again is like making me re reminisce about it. It's um, you've it, it had the extensor tendon thing a few times, haven't you? Like I remember you had. Remember you used to wear yeah. Solar Glide? Was it Solar Glide from Adidas? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Adidas. Yeah, yeah, good memory. Yeah, Adidas Solar yeah. Glide gave me it. Um, it's like a crease. I think it's a crease point in the shoe or something. So it's like yeah. when yeah, as, as the forefoot bends, it's like the shoe just creases right on over one of the tendons. Yeah. Um, it's probably just unique to. I don't know anyone else that's had that problem. You but do, no. I don't feel like yeah. that at all. No. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, shoe, yeah. yeah, I've been a fan. It mm. feels light. It almost feels a bit too light for an easy day shoe. Like you're running along, you're picking your legs up quickly, and I'm thinking, oh. That's, that's one, one of the main differences between that and the Invincible, because like when, yeah. the Invincible is actually pretty heavy, like for, yeah. for a PIBA, mm. a PIBA based shoe compared to this, which just feels so much lighter in hand and on mm. foot. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I've also been wearing the New Balance 1080 V V13 sample, so it's production line sample, so it's yeah, it's ready to go. I'll show that one on a later episode, but yeah. um, and I'll talk you through it on that. But yeah, that's been actually like a real surprise to me because I th I didn't think it was going to work, but I've been really liking my running in it. Okay. But at the same time. I've been really enjoying my running anyway, and and it's often that it correlates. Like you have, you have good like memory associations. Two two weeks ago, you were ragging on the Nimbus Twenty Five. You weren't having a great time, and now you're loving the Nimbus Twenty Five, or you at least like it. It's definitely your yeah. emotional state, Julian. Yeah, it could be. I could probably put some bad shoes on now and and still associate good times with them. Um, <laughs> But yeah, we'll get into that later down the track. I'll explain the differences and and yeah. and also what I like about it. But I've been in in terms of workout shoes because I'm not preparing for the a race that I'm locked into one shoe, which was the Rebellion for for Mizuno. I'm getting to play around with a few others. So this week I wore the Super Comp Elite for my Wednesday workout, and then on the Sunday um, I wore the Alpha Fly version one 
-hmm. And so, yeah, it's, it's nice to feel like it's nice to test them all out and give them a, give them a shot. And I'm getting to know them a little better and work out what I like in, in a super shoe. I don't think there is a perfect one right now. Still, uh, it's, it's it may, like the alpha fly still feels a little clunky to me, especially, uh, after having all these other lighter weight, smoother feels underfoot, the contrast between super comp elite into alpha fly is like buttery smooth underfoot into pretty clunky kind of segmented type shoe. Uh, I didn't really enjoy that too much. I don't think I'll be going back to the alpha fly again. Um, I did hear though, Bree sort of mentioned that when she's been running in the second version because of the higher offset, a little bit more foam underneath the pods up front, it's a smoother feel. Would yeah. you agree? So I've only tried it on as a sample a couple of times. I saw Bree post through there saying it was the best super shoe she's worn. And look, I didn't feel that it was uh, much far removed from the Alpha One, except for it definitely wasn't as um, segmented as you said. You know, you could feel the difference between the forefoot and the rear foot on Alpha One. They feel quite different. But I think something as simple as putting the foam beneath the pods more so on the second version, the surface area is still wide. Maybe the offset being, you know, slightly higher pitch makes it a little bit cleaner as well. But it definitely felt like a less um, less of a sweet spot on that shoe than it did on the V1. But obviously, consequently, it's probably more, um, you know, more reliability to each step. Yeah. 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 So I might try the twos out. But uh, I'll, go, I'll go back into the Elite for a few. I'll wear the Vaporfly for a few and I'll start to work out what the potential marathon shoe would be. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, so that's me. That's me in my week. Mark. That's good. Yeah. What about you? Uh, look, I've been rotating between the Nimbus 25. That's been my highest volume shoe out of about 100K weeks. I'm wearing that for about 70 of them, I reckon. Uh, maybe 60. Uh, and I'm wearing... When I'm on the road, so we've got mainly trail in our backyard on the roads, I've still been wearing the Cloud Monster. I love that shoe on the roads. It seems to work well for me on a harder surface. I'm struggling with pavement, but that shoe, look, a slightly less compliant shoe, I'm enjoying a more resilient shoe on the actual, uh, the, yeah, so the opposite to probably what you would normally wear, like a really compliant shoe on the road. I've been preferring the resilient shoe on the road. So, so I've gone back to the Monster. It's pretty durable, isn't it? Like, I've had 250Ks in this shoe, and it doesn't feel like it's worn at all. So... Mm. Um, so it is a firmer midsole in that setting. Um, for sessions or longer sessions and threshold type sessions, I've been using the Supercom V3 Elite. It's, it's perfect for that, like a slightly slower pace for longer durations. It's almost my favorite shoe for that type of workout now, I reckon. Um, yeah. And I, I've worn the Alpha Fly for my workouts that have been a, a bit more a bit more upbeat, so closer to one K Rex or closer to three minute K pace. It's still for me the shoe that works the best. I like the Alpha Fly. Uh, but I haven't tried the second version for workouts yet, so that's probably something on the list to do as well. But um, the Endorphin Elite I've worn it a few times. I really like it. I think I'd run better at a 5K and 10K in that shoe. And as Tom said, I reckon maybe the lack of compliance and the ultra resilience to the foam it might not give as much back at the end of the marathon potentially. So I'm looking forward to running a fast 5K or 10K and that shoe and really trying it out. It definitely feels better at the shorter the shorter paces. So fits well. And in fact, I find it almost fits a bit wide for me in the forefoot. I don't know what you mm. guys found about it. I found it pretty baggy in the forefoot, um, which is not yeah, a bad thing. Roomy. To, yeah, roomy. Um, the rest of the upper is, is still relatively stable. I think Julie explained this on the last podcast. Like It's just got the um, the connection of the wraps on the midfoot that to the laces that tends to make it pretty secure. So they've been the shoes I've been rotating to. Like a Super Blast I wear for a long run because it's the one shoe I can pick the pace up on pretty comfortably. So I wore that even the trails and the roads, hybrids well on both. It's really stable. Um, can't fault it. Put a heel pitch in it though. It still feels a bit better with the four mil heel pitch. Do you put a heel pitch in it as well, Tom? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Do yeah. you guys just have endless, endless supply of heel? I, like, uh, I have probably a hundred around floating around the house. So many yeah, just, just packets yeah. everywhere, mate. <laughs> Form products are the best as well. Yeah, they absolutely um, are the best for sure. Hey, Nitta, how many Ks do you reckon you've done in your Nimbus? Just curious to know how what you reckon with durability wise with that one. Yeah, so I'm bottoming out the forefoot now on the first version. I actually sent the email to the Asics guy. I don't ask for many shoes, but I love the shoes so much. I've asked for another pair. It's 700 and 740 k's the Nimbus. 
and I fell at the bottom of the ground at about maybe 650. So it was pretty good. Okay, not too bad. Yeah, yeah more than I thought. So, yeah. How are you getting so many Ks? You barely run. Well, look, I've had the Nimbus. I've had the Super Blast and the Nimbus for ages now. I think we got the Super Blast. Oh, back in, that's right. Maybe I reckon October, and I had the October. Nimbus. For, actually, no, I've, yeah. the, I've had I've had the Nimbus for four months now. I reckon so. Yeah. Yeah. In- influencer life. <laughs> <laughs> Podiatrist influences. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. that brings us to our next topic, doesn't it? So um, there's been a nice article floating around on the internet uh, on case studies. I might pass it over to Tom because you read it a bit more in detail. I actually read most of it last night, but it was essentially a paper looking at the relationship between uh, navicular stress fractures and wearing super shoes. Um, yeah, so I actually haven't read it since it came out. So I'm going to be, you're probably going to be fresher on this than me. But um, okay. yeah, I think it was what, five five case, case studies? Yep. So I think... Ba- the, the thing I, li- I listened to it more recently in the format of people like talking about it on mm-hmm. socials or podcasts. Yeah. Um, and it, it even came out on, I think it was BJSM podcast, which is British Journal of Sports Medicine, which mm-hmm. is fairly well regarded and probably a lot of clinicians will be listening to it, which actually was a worry because with the, the author on, on there and the guy that interview, interviewed him, it, it, they made it seem a lot more um, definitive or like like there was more <laughs> evidence than there actually is. Um, and, you know, as you could probably talk about like the hierarchy of evidence, maybe you want to touch on that, like case studies versus a yeah. randomised control trial. So that's exactly right. So these case studies, it makes this paper published uh, basically an opinion piece. Um, and look, I think what they're trying to do is make awareness that potentially... You know, like years ago when you moved from like a normal shoe to a minimal shoe, they were trying to make a transition period notice. So you wouldn't just go from fixing all your knee pain by wearing a traditional shoe, wearing the minimal shoe, and then suddenly you break your metatarsals because that's the load change. So they're trying to say that with these changes of wearing super shoes, perhaps there's a risk attached to it. And they've used case studies, which is a lower form of evidence than say running a study, which is um, say controlled and in a controlled environment, you know, systemizing a, a group with no intervention and having an intervention and following them for a period of time and getting a really positive outcome um, versus just literally taking people in the field and saying, hey, this is your experience with them. Let's compile these experiences and tell you that this is what's happening in the real world. So it may not be translating to, you know, to the population because it's an opinion piece. So it makes it low evidence. But the problem with the case studies is that they're really that people like reading about them and they're easy to translate and sometimes they get more leverage because people will sort of try and, you know, relate them to their own experiences. And that's what a lot of people have done with this particular study. So they use five case studies um, of these people who ended up with navicular stress, varying degrees of navicular stress fractures um, who have different experiences. I think there were like two steeple chasers uh, that were, one was junior, one was, a, uh, actually both might've been juniors, two experienced runners, um, more recreational, and another adult male runner who had transitioned into using super shoes with no specific fashion. So in, in one case study, I think someone wore the shoe three times in their training load uh, before they developed the navicular stress fracture. In two other case studies, I think, as you mentioned, Tom, they had pre-existing navicular stress fractures before they went into the super shoes. Uh, one was actually on the navicular site that was currently injured as well. So. There were so many confounders to the study that don't have any association to whether the shoes were completely causative of the injury. There might just be a bit of an association to putting them on. The problem is that you put super shoes on for usually the faster workouts and intervals. And I think almost everyone in this study used them for the shorter interval work, or at least four of them did in the case studies. And faster running in itself is a risk factor for navicular stress fracture. Um, their hypothesis is that the compliance of the shoe and being really, really high stack, you may lead to more compensations and translations through the foot that the medial part of the foot might get more load on it. That's just an outline of what they were suggesting. So this whole study was basically an opinion piece to try and create awareness that these shoes might be a risk factor, which is a little bit sad, to be honest, I think. You know, I think risk factors in running are pretty pretty broad and varied. And um, you could almost make the argument that... I, I don't know what you're like, Tom, but I would argue that I've seen less foot-related injury generally from the super shoes and lower leg-related injuries in the super shoes than I was when people were wearing traditional shoes like the Streak and the Adios, etc. 
as a general statement. I mean, look, I don't have, once again, that's an opinion. It's no different to case studies, but I reckon I can pull together 19 case studies of people that have moved into super shoes in an attempt to decrease foot and lower leg related injuries for faster running. Yeah, I, 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 yeah. <clears throat> my, my opinion would be the same is, is like clinically, and this, this is what these case studies were based on was a, I think it was a sports medicine clinic and they'd have patients coming in runners with this injury and um i like especially um yeah like i mean i I would have the opposite opinion potentially like that that these shoes would potentially reduce navicular um risk as opposed to increasing risk um just simply because just simply again like it's opinion but the paper the I'd almost like over case studies, I'd almost would rather see like a, a biomechanical study, which would actually really identify if there's actually a change in mechanical load with these, with these shoes, which using kinematics or, you know, um, a, a model to try and s- simulate where the load would go with these shoes. Um, because like you said, there's too many confounders when it comes to taking a history of a runner and like what they didn't tell you, they, they yeah. might've changed or, you know, um, but yeah, I, I think it'd be similar to metatarsal risk. Like we know that yeah. anecdotally that um, when you go to less shoe or traditional racing flats that we saw, um, a, you know, a lot more metatarsal stress fractures. Um, yep. And I would say that it, this similar load, there's obviously some differences with the navicular. I think there are some, some more risk with some other um, planes of motion, I guess, at the foot level, but um, yeah, I would say it's still similar, close enough that yeah. if you're going to increase your metatarsal risk, you'll probably increase your navicular risk. And I think the super shoes might actually lower that lower that risk for, for many runners. But, you know, we talk about importance of studies as well. I mean, I don't know if it's translated into retail, Julian, but like I have colleagues who I work with in Adelaide who are talking about this paper as super shoes now are a risk factor. So when it comes into the consultation through here, when I'm speaking to recreational runners, say someone, you know, signed up their life to do the New York marathon, they start their six month journey. Like at usually some point in time, they'll ask about the shoe. And of course, if, you know, part of the process of going into these shoes is getting people to run more, first of all, you know, more running is a risk factor, but it's also important for like, you know, handling a marathon and fitness and conditioning as well. But I'm not turning people away from this case study to super shoes because it's, I don't think it's an in real, it's a, it's an in world ex, like relative experience. It's purely an opinion piece, and I'd almost argue if you ran, you know, a controlled study and you put people into racing flats, um, traditional ones, into super shoes, and into a control shoe, and you follow them for twelve months, I don't think you'd see a difference. In fact, I'd see, I'd, I'd hypothetically think globally, you see less foot injury in super shoe. That would be my my guess initially, just from you know three or four years of working with people being wearing them. So. Uh, it's interesting people were just flagging it. I know some other podiatrists are flagging the frontal plane position being more dramatic in the super shoes. We see that all the time. You know, you run a marathon, you see guys everting all over the place in the high stack shoes. Is that a risk factor? Yeah, for some things, but it probably decreases risk of other things as well. So it's complicated to have a study come out like that and flag it as a potential um, um, a reason to not promote that shoe to be worn. And for some people, it's better than others, but. There's such a variation of super shoes now in terms of surface areas as well now and, and how stable each one is comparatively. You can almost put any foot into some sort of super shoe now with a bit more success than another super shoe if you get the foot matched to that profile and have good success. Yeah. Very good. Mm. Anything to say on that? Or are you just think of Nerd Burger mm. in the background there, Bruce? Yeah. Well, I mean, you guys do the nerd stuff on this. The only time we're going to see this pop up is if one practitioner who doesn't really uh, get involved in the shoe world or the running scene very often listens to the podcast that you listen to, Tom, and starts telling all his patients that they shouldn't be in these shoes, and then they come in and relay that to us and they relay that to their training group. And as you know, practitioners are gods. So everyone, like, why would anyone else have a different opinion to them? Um, Yeah. That's that's the that's the danger I see here. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's what that's that's what annoyed. That's kind of was frustrating for me, like seeing that on a kind kind of a, a platform that a lot of practitioners probably listen to, and then yeah, if they're not into running, they probably 
will think, oh yeah, super shoes. They're going to be. They're going to. I'm going to see so many more foot injuries in these super shoes. Yeah. But BJSM yeah, now. on Twitter has turned into a bit of a tabloid, to be honest. <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So it's tricky yeah. to um to be able to use that. But yeah, you, you don't want. Of course, the author's going to speak about their paper, but um, you know, to be able to make it bigger than what it is in terms of a case study, it's, it's you can't be doing that. So we can all do that. We can all make case studies up and compile them. And it's just that I'm surprised it um gets published and gets so much more leverage than you know something that hasn't actually been discovered to be useful or not. It's just an opinion piece. But look, maybe they'll follow it up with a randomized control paper. And maybe they'll like show us that hey, look, navicular stress is a risk in uh, high stack compliance. So it should, they don't have to be proved wrong, but I doubt it. All right. What was the other study that you were going to tear apart? Well, look, I think we'll come back to this one. This was the one where they were looking at um, the super shoes amongst the cohort of it was East African runners, wasn't it, Tom? Oh, and they were looking at right. yeah. the running economy, um, the variations of running economy when they went into different types of shoes. So they had a traditional uh, racing flat and they had a couple of different super shoes off memory. And unlike many papers where people respond to the super shoes positively in running economy, improving their running economy, which is pretty much across the board for most papers. This one showed a large variation of running economy change. So some some runners decreased their economy, some increased and some didn't change too much. And some increased in traditional shoes and some decreased in a certain type of super shoe. And there was large variation of this. So you dived into it a bit more than I did, Tom, off memory. So do you remember it a bit more? Yeah, so there, was, so there was seven elite um, Kenyan distance runners and seven... Um, recreational european distance runners i think that they they tested a control shoe like a, a flat compared to three prototype adidas um super shoes they're unnamed so i don't actually know which models they are whether they're even on the market at the moment but um yes yeah, so i think it was an adidas poss possibly adidas funded um but the yeah the crazy thing was so i because i did a, i did a presentation for the australia like the APOD A, Australian Podiatry Association, last year um, on like super shoes. And I remember there was a slide that I did that was like collating all, all the studies out. And what I said was like, what was really novel about this footwear research around the super shoes was the fact that only one study out of, out of seven that were published uh, um, looking at economy versus a control flat racing shoe, um, only one study had non-responders and every other study every participant in those studies had a benefit it was just a matter of like how much benefit so the original study um um it was 18 but this is the nike four percent how they came up with a four percent like every 18 of those runners had a benefit it was but it was either two percent or it was six percent average was four percent but there were no non-responders and so it was like okay so pretty much you can say wear a super shoe you're going to get a benefit it just you just don't know whether you're going to be a super responder or just to you know respond a little bit um yeah. whereas like this study it showed like with especially it was wild with the the canyon elites like one of the um elite canyons had a reduced running economy by like 11 point something percent <laughs> on the super shoes versus the flat, which is crazy. Like, so he became really inefficient in the super shoe. Um, and then there was another one that had an equal positive benefit. So he had like an 11 point something percent improved running economy, which is crazy. That's a crazy increase in running economy. But there was a 22% difference like between that, which is just, it's wild. So um, yeah, it was an interesting study in that respect that there was, I haven't seen any other study have such variability. Um, and Look, it begs the question what these shoes are as well. Like, is this guy jogging in, is one of the super shoe categories of Boston 10 or Boston 11 that gets released or something like yeah. that? It's got like 450 grams of weight behind it or something. So. <laughs> yeah, 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 true. Um, yeah, so yeah, so yeah. Um, I just think, yeah, it was it's interesting. There's more, I guess there's more, it just, I reckon it kind of just says there's probably more to to come and more to look into and maybe especially with elites that are looking at performing well like they need to um, they need to really find what they respond to um, and it may not be a lab t study that'll tell them because um, when I, I remember I can't remember exactly but I, I read I already read the whole paper and there was a bit about how um, so one of the runners that had really poor response to one of the shoes, he might have had reduced running economy by about six percent, 
but that shoe he raced in recently and ran like a, a, a one minute PB over the half. He ran like a 58 minute half marathon in a shoe that's supposedly it. on the treadmill. He had a reduced yeah. running economy by 6%. <laughs> um, so I think, I think that's where like the, the lab based studies maybe don't fully translate out on the road. Um, yeah. Whether they're not, but maybe these canyons weren't accustomed to running on the like. Yeah, the main thing I can think yeah, of is that yeah, like, maybe they weren't. Yeah, the treadmill was like mm -hmm. they're just a bit awkward on the treadmill, yeah. um, and it's not translating to overground running. But even like getting used to the um, the uh, the gas exchange masks as well, like that could be quite foreign, you know, uh, initially as well. And like you get, you almost get better at those tests with time, and then becomes more reliability over time with more exposure to those tests as well. So. And look, of course, you know, I know it was um, the guy we interviewed on here, Justin Jobert, he even looked at like, you know, running economy for the super shoes at slower paces. So 16 k yeah. per hour is the norm. He looked at slower paces and showed, look, all these super shoes do improve your economy, but it seems like not as big a, big a difference when you got the slower paces. And suddenly when they go out to these race paces of like 20 k an hour and 21 k an hour where... There are other limiting factors besides your running economy to the ability to run that face, like you know your VO2, your velocity at VO2 max and other attributes like that. But look, maybe your economy variability is quite large with different shoes and different paces as well. So, uh, I, like I said, you know I feel like the endorphin elite matches me when I'm running close to the three minute k pace better. But I feel like the outfly is probably a bit better when I'm running close to 16 k's per hour, and that's perceptual, of course, not actually lab tested, but. There could be variability within pace as well, and like you said, that's that's in field testing versus lab testing. Yeah, I I wonder, just like from a, you've been scratchy there, Jolly. Yeah, are you? I'm hearing that, so I'm thinking that's yeah. you. Is it okay? Or Tom? Um, so from a retail perspective, like you've got, we've got eight super shoes in the store right now. A customer comes in and goes, I want to know which one's right for me. We can't, um, we can't, sorry, I'll get that feedback. Or, what is that? It's got to be you, I reckon. Well, why can I hear it though? I don't know. I can't hear it. Oh, it must be you then, Tommy. I'll take it out. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll mute me. It's gone. Yeah, it's gone. It's you, Tom. <laughs> All right. So yeah, like going back, there's um, say there's eight, uh, eight different shoes in here, and the customer goes, "Which one's right for me?" We can't. <laughs> we don't have a. We don't have a like a, a VO two testing setup. For, um, Why don't you? So What's that I, about? Is that just yeah. something economical to do? <laughs> it would be pretty fun. It would be an experience. That's for sure. Yeah. But. I wonder if that person that measured 11% lower running economy in that shoe could tell. If, yeah, if, yeah. You, if you asked them afterwards and said, which one worked the best for you, could they yeah. pick and go, that was good, that was yeah. no good, this was okay? Because uh, yeah. I, I reckon they could. Exactly. I don't know if any, anyone's done that with all the papers. We see all this objective running economy stuff, but they haven't lined up something subjective next to it off memory, I don't think, in terms of an effort scale. And Look, we do things simple, like, you, you know, you do your lactate test, you put an RPE effort scale and a heart rate next to it. Um, but, yeah, it'll be interesting to see if people can comfort-wise perceive that they're moving better or moving easier subjectively to match the objective. Yeah, yeah, I, mm. I would be really interested in that one. Mm. Yeah. Because well, I think because in, in your shop you're selling subjectively, right? So in, yeah, hopefully, exactly. if that could match the objective, you're doing your job just by getting pushing people in the right direction of comfort, and if they feel like they're moving better. So cues we give him, we we we're, we're having them consider the cues mm. of of what we want them to feel, which yep. is smooth, natural, light, fast, um, all those things we want. Like it's and it's tough because you might get an alpha fly on that's super clunky feel mm. to give you the, the best running economy. Yep. Is is that going to be worth it or not for you? I don't it's know. True. Yeah. Well, look, I think you know if someone's got better running economy in a shoe, you would assume the outcome will be better. But if it's not comfortable for them, does that play a role in reducing performance in another attribute or just motivation or something as well? Yeah, but mm. often often relates. It's this conversation sort of related back to 
Galen Rupp a lot of the time who would use science as one of the big determiners in everything that they did in that group. And when the Alpha Fly Vapor Fly came out, like let's say Galen tested so much more efficient in the Alpha Fly, mm -hmm. even though it's heavier or whatever, that's the shoe that he'll wear. Yeah. Um, it sort of makes me wonder if that's the reason that he wore that victory that day on the, on the track that tore his feet up, even though it didn't fit properly. Like, yeah. is it testing that's telling you to wear these, even though, uh, like, re in reality, they might not be the best option? It's true. Tom, you love all the objective testing stuff and reading about it, but yet you're probably the most objective runner in this group right now, aren't you? You don't even like using heart rate. You always run to feel, and nothing feels like a Vaporfly 1 for you. That's like the yeah, Vaporfly Next Percent 1 for you as well. So you're looking for that shoe that feels either the same or better again, you're hoping that's the vapor flight three. Yeah, I've got so that's my benchmark. That's what I know, and I, I mm -hmm. compare every shoe against that shoe. Mm -hmm. uh, and perceptually, nothing has has eclipsed it or even got that close. Maybe the the Asics Metaspeed Sky One, I felt yep. kind of got close. I'd probably race. I'd probably race a half marathon in that shoe happily. Yeah. Um, but um, oh yeah, I cannot. I cannot wait for vapor Fly three. What if you test in it? like an alpha flyer tom and you were better like, economy wise would you wear it yeah I, I might do a bit more training and just sort of feel it out and see if i mm. if i get used to it um but if it still continues to feel unnatural and like it yeah n no i wouldn't race in it just <laughs> it would still it would need to feel as good yeah. um on foot even if the numbers told me it was a bit better yeah. Would you do it, Julian? If your numbers were better, but it didn't feel ideal, would you would you prefer the numbers or would you feel feel one hundred percent feel because the numbers aren't ref aren't reality. The numbers are running economy, which doesn't order like we don't. That person that ran eleven percent faster or like more efficient in that shoe, mm. that might not translate to any faster in in a race or running, like in real life. So yep. the, we're caught up in those numbers right now. Yep, it's true. I agree. So what's exciting? So, Tom, by the time we speak to you next, you'll have a vapor fly free, won't you, potentially? I or hope you'll so. have a stress fracture. One of those two. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping I'll have, I'm hoping I'll, I'll race, um, I'll race Hamburg in the, in the V3 vapor yep. fly, if I like yep. it. I mean, it, it sounds good. Um, so I know we've, we've been chatting about it, about mm. the change. Like, it sounds like it's a bit softer. Um, it sounds like it's got more stack. It's no heavier. It might actually mm -hmm. be lighter. So it's yep. more more stack, softer, and lighter. Like that yeah. all sounds, sounds like good, doesn't it? awesome yeah. to me. So yeah. if it gets closer to version one, so if it's softer, it probably will feel more like version one. So with that compliance, because it basically in version two, I felt like I lost a little bit of that that compliance yeah, out of yeah. the shoe. Um, so if version three goes back to um, a bit more compliance or softness, then yeah, I'll be I'll be happy. Absolutely. What are you looking forward to, Julian? uh in the shoe world what's coming out there's not a great deal coming in the short term i'm going to get myself an invincible three at some point yeah yeah you've been uh, avoiding that has that is, has it changed a lot from v v2 there have been some changes yeah the fit's different doesn't yeah. the midsole is different as well it doesn't feel as clunky i don't think anymore like as massive as oversize uh it's still got a fairly wide base on it and it's still got a lot of outer sole but yep. it just doesn't feel as big of a shoe so i'm going to see yep. how that goes makes sense yep okay. what about you uh yeah, not much exciting i'm going to go through this rotation i've been consistent for a while so i won't change well, but i'm actually considering uh just getting an alpha two as well just purely on your wife's strava post it was yeah. enough to get me yeah that's the best sales well, one is following the you better get it from me then yeah. you better get yeah. it from me because that's marketing it's true. Yeah. You're gonna reward that yeah. marketing. That's true. Sucking you yeah. in. Bringing the suckers yeah, she in. Needed, she needed to have like a little uh, link on it as well, and then yeah. here yeah. and purchase and pay and yeah, like <laughs> absolutely. I always follow the smoothest mover in your household. Always follow what she she says. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't seen me lately. I have been moving. <laughs> I've it well. Is has right. Bree got a race coming up? Berlin Marathon. Ah, of course. Yeah. All right. So, Jeez. battle of the uh, household. 
Yeah, um, Pia will be a bit older, be able to tolerate the flight by then. It'll be a bit longer Pia flight. Pia stay in here. Pia oh, is not going near an aeroplane ever again. Yeah, okay. Fair enough. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Remember that. She's going to leave at home. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. That's okay. a good one. It's enough See you guys. Yeah. Sounds See good. See you guys later. See you guys.